G'day, Pete. Now, I, I don't like the way you said Victorian there with the emphasis. Um, <laughs> us Mexicans down here are not all that bad, I've got to tell you. Um, well, how do you, well, how do you, how, how do you read into it? I mean, there has been a spike. I mean, uh, New South Wales has yeah. more numbers, but Victoria seems to be getting out of hand at the moment. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I think a couple of points. First, there was always the likelihood of um, outbreaks uh, occurring as you ease some restrictions. I think the outbreaks in Victoria were particularly around uh, one family or a couple of families, particular community. There was a talk about the fact that they, they weren't, they were, um, they had language issues and they weren't, you know, understanding all of the, the uh, restrictions and the, and the guidelines and that, that needs to be addressed. In fact, I actually, in my lecture, I sent out a couple of months ago, uh, a letter out to uh, migrant groups and, and other groups in the top five languages uh, that have spoken in my lecture, because I understood that that was a, uh, an issue as well. People not really understanding the guidelines and making sure that they they get all the information at their disposal. Mm. But there was always going to be these outbreaks. And I, I, look, I don't. I mean, other states certainly have to protect their residents. Um, um, you know, apart from the the joking around about the, the rivalry rivalry between Victoria and New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian is entitled to do that. I noted too that Daniel Andrews said that he's talking regularly with her and they're working together, which is a good thing. Because fact, frankly, whether it's Victorians or New South Wales, people in New South Wales, or any other part of us, all Australians have to continue to follow the medical advice. Um, we've done really well in this country uh, uh, to, to suppress the virus, to flatten the curve. We've all made massive sacrifices. And I think um, it's hard to keep the social distancing going. It really is. Um, but people need to continue to do that because yeah. there are those risks of a second spike or a third spike. Yeah, well, maybe this is the wake-up call that we needed because I've certainly noted that. I mean, just I mean, in Sydney. Uh, people are definitely becoming complacent uh, when it comes to the restrictions. But just on Victoria, Peter, so you, you've, you've identified, you know, some areas in Melbourne where, where these outbreaks have occurred in, in areas where, where English um, people might not have a hold of English. So in that sense, is the, is the state government failing in its messaging? Well, I understand the um, state government is putting out information to, and working, trying to work better with multicultural Communities. I've got to say this broadly, it's not a particular criticism of the Victorian government. Multicultural communities, migrant communities tend to kind of be a bit of an afterthought um, with respect to these kind of campaigns. I, I don't. I come from a migrant background and I have a lot of diversity in my lecture. That's why I made sure to send out information in, in the five languages uh, that are prevalent in my lecture. Um, I, I think state and federal governments need to do better in, in uh, reaching those communities because they are Australians as well. Uh, even if they're recently arrived migrants and they're learning English, you need to be able to communicate the important information to everyone in the community so that we all uh, understand what needs to be done. Well, I mean, you just referred to this. Uh, I mean, Gladys Berejiklian in saying yesterday that businesses here, particularly in ski fields, now that school holidays are approaching, shouldn't interact with people from, from those hotspots <laughs> in Melbourne. What, what's your view on that? I mean, Josh Frydenberg, another Victorian on the show a little bit earlier, said that, uh, that he, he would be against that kind of behaviour. He's... You know, he's all for us, oh. you know, being together in all of this, um, you know, would be welcoming when it comes to, you know, Victorians crossing the border into New South Wales. He said that that should continue. So what's your view as well? Well, I, I, I've got to say I'm going to be, I'm shocking myself that I'll be, I'll be agreeing with Josh on this one. We are all Australians uh, and this kind of state uh, rivalry kind of thing is often joked about in state of origin with you guys in mm. Queensland and us in the AFL with South Australia and Western Australia. But uh, underneath all of that, we're all Australians, and I, and I would agree with Josh in his sentiments on this. We're in this together. We can actually get out of it together. We have to work uh, effectively together. So um, I would agree with him and okay. his sentiments. Well, here's something that you probably won't agree with him about, and that's uh, Albo's pitch to end the carbon wars. He's got a speech coming up later on today at the press club, about 12.30. it will be live here on Sky News when it does. He reckons it's a pipe dream. Uh, is it? I mean, it's, it's been a war that's been going on for 10 years now. I mean, are, are you going to get support from both sides when it comes to this particular topic? Well, you, you, you characterise it as a war that's been going on for 10 years. And in, those, in that decade, Labor has tried again and again, even in the last seven years, I think eight or nine times have reached out to the coalition and said, let us agree on a bipartisan policy to go forward, take the politics out of this, so that we can actually start investing in renewable energy, creating jobs, uh, and actually moving forward uh, to do what's best for the national interest. And each time, 
the whole thing got blown up by the Liberal Party room where they rejected the NEG, where they rejected their own uh, uh, renewable energy targets, uh, blown up by the right-wingers and the dinosaurs who are climate change denialists in their own coalition, um, despite us making every attempt in opposition in the past seven years to reach bipartisanship on this. Albo is doing the right thing. He's reaching out again in a constructive way to say, OK, let's agree on your most recent, I think, 15th iteration of, a, uh, of an energy policy and let's agree on a bipartisan stance so we can actually move forward and do what is necessary to reduce emissions and to create jobs and to invest in renewable energy. There's got to be a willingness, Peter, by Scott Morrison and his party and, and the Nationals to actually engage on this, not to run anti-renewable mm. scare campaigns and play politics with this. It's too important to play politics with. We need to get this right, and I back Albo all the way. In, and another attempt is whatever it is, the 12th, 14th attempt to try and get bipartisanship on this very important issue for the nation. It's going to be tricky, though. I mean, this is going to be tough, isn't it? Well, the toughness is on their side, mate. Like, they have repeatedly blown themselves up when, when they got close, they got really close to an energy a guarantee, they got really close to an energy policy or a, a climate change policy, and then within their own party, um, there are a certain number of them who decided to blow the whole thing up. Mm. Um, they need to sort that out because it's too important for the nation. Uh, just finally, Peter, I know you're a one-time uh, professional tennis player. I've got to get your thoughts on Novak Djokovic. Uh, he's tested positive to coronavirus um, for this competition that he was, or this exhibition contest that he was organising. Uh, I think it was in Croatia. Uh, there were a whole bunch of warnings that it shouldn't go ahead, including from Nick Kyrgios. Um, there was no effort to, um, to social distance or anything like that. Uh, so Kyrgios has called him a bonehead. What do you, th what do you think of it? <laughs> Isn't it fantastic to see Nick Kyrgios, our Nick Kyrgios being the sensible one uh, and showing maturity here? And I think this is not a, a one-off thing. This is a, probably a development. You remember with, the, with, with his great efforts around the bushfire appeal, the money that he raised, he had a really great run at the Australian Open. He was showing signs of maturity. We know he's had his problems um, early on. Leighton Hewitt had his problems early on too uh, when he was younger and he matured and became number one in the world. Uh, I remember practicing with Leighton when I was, uh, as you say, a so-called professional tennis player many, many years ago uh, in 98 in London. Uh, my claim to fame is that I played the Australian Open juniors. But anyway, Nick is uh, mature on this point. He's right on this point. I think it was very responsible by Novak Djokovic. He has a responsibility as being number one in the world. Uh, and he's uh, really got this one wrong, hasn't he?